Uh, the title of this talk is, Will the Stone the Builders Rejected uh, Become the Cornerstone? And I think that will make, make sense near the end of the talk. Um, but the stone is secession. And it was rejected. And uh, will it become the cornerstone? The culture war has removed Confederate monuments at an alarming rate. It may soon be the case in the foreseeable future that hardly any remain. If this happens, would that mean the end of the Southern tradition? Traditions do die. And I'm not going to try to answer that because in part it depends on what we do. But in order to think about it, let's go back to a time before there was a culture war. <clears throat> Back to 1956, the year I graduated from high school in Charlotte, North Carolina. At that time, Confederate symbols were a normal part of life. Uh, we had a minor league baseball team, the Charlotte Hornets, that opened each game with a color guard bearing the stars and stripes and the Confederate battle flag. We did a pious singing of the national anthem, after which a spirited singing of Dixie. <laughs> Every day at noon, Toscanini's symphonic version of Dixie was played on WBT radio. WBT. And, and radio stations throughout the South would often sign off at, with Dixie. Airlines and passenger trains would sometimes play a strain of Dixie upon crossing the Mason-Dixon line. I was on an Eastern Airline plane that did that. President Eisenhower kept a portrait of Robert E. Lee in the Oval Office for two terms. Lee was admired nationally and internationally, and Eisenhower held him up publicly as an American character for emulation. When I arrived at, arrived at what is now Woke Wake Forest University, in the early 1960s, a portrait of Robert E. Lee graced the philosophy classroom we used. Congress had declared Confederate veterans to be American veterans. And a long line of army forts were named after Confederate generals. Gone with the Wind was the greatest box office hit in film history at that time. And in 1942, Hollywood made a popular film on the origin of the song Dixie, starring Bing Crosby and Dorothy L'Amour. The advertisement described Dixie as, quote, a rousing song that expresses the spirit of America, end quote. Not the spirit of the South, the spirit of America. This favorable view of the Confederacy is as gone with the wind today as is the America that made it possible. That's gone too. And I lament its passing. But looking back, I can see that it hid from the public any deep understanding of the constitutional, philosophical, and moral meaning of the war. The condition for reunion was that the South would put aside any thought of independence or secession, and that the North would uh, acknowledge that Southern would acknowledge Southern valor and that Southerners, Southerners fought for what they thought was right. Uh, of course, they were mistaken. But these terms meant that so Confederate symbols for us really pointed only to Southern valor and honor, not to the meaning of the battles which they fought. See? So it was the war and honor of valor. So growing up surrounded by Confederate symbols, I developed a strong Southern identity, coupled with an astonishing ignorance about the war's meaning. I'm embarrassed to say how ignorant I was. <clears throat> It was not until I was working on my doctorate in philosophy in the mid-60s that I discovered in a used bookshop that the Confederate battle flag 
was not the national flag if I, if I had ever thought there was a national flag. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't go that far. And I discovered there were three national flags. As a southerner, I was mortified. If I did not know this, what else did I not know? <laughs> After decades of self-study, independent of my philosophic work, um, uh, so this was done on the side, but there was a lot of it done, there gradually came into focus an image of the South and of an America that I shall call tonight, and I've called it before, Jeffersonian America, which was overthrown in 1865 by revolutionary Lincolnian America under which we live today. And what follows, I want to explain a little bit uh, the two Americas just mentioned, the Jeffersonian, the two visions, uh, the Jeffersonian and the Lincolnian. And how the struggle between them in 1861 is part of the culture war we are in today. <clears throat> now to do this, we need to understand the difference between medieval and modern notions of political reality. Because the Jeffersonians had one foot still in the Middle Ages, and the Lincolnians had jumped out of it completely and were inhabiting only uh, the modern political order. Now you might say, the Middle Ages, oh, they've gotten a bad rap. Uh, and I don't mean the Black Death, and I don't mean torture chambers. Uh, what I mean is there's so much of our culture today we've inherited from the medievals. Uh, for example, um, parliaments. You like parliaments? You like trial by jury? You like jury nullification? Do you like sheriffs? Do you like mayors? Um, do you like the right to bear arms? These are all medieval things. You don't, you, you don't find modern European states approving the right to bear arms, right? right? Except for Switzerland. And it's the least modern of all the European states. It's very medieval in many ways. So by medieval I mean the structure of the political culture. <coughs> Now, in medieval political society, what is a political order? A political order is an order of naturally formed um, social authorities, corporate things, the family, the church, the lords, the commons, uh, the free city of um, Leipzig or whatever it might be. Each of these things has something of its own to enjoy, which is out of bounds for the other social authorities. They may not enter. The church had sanctuaries. You'll be a criminal if you would get in the church, the king couldn't get you. you see? see the difference? William Pitt reminded Parliament, the king of England has many powers, but he may not enter a peasant's cottage without his permission. And the city of London today, uh, sorry, the King of England cannot enter the city of London today without the mayor's permission. Don't confuse the city of London with that sprawling thing called London, which contains Buckingham Palace. They're, they're two different things. And that prohibition goes back to William the Conqueror. The kings had to stay out. <clears throat> Now, modern thinkers criticize this medieval system uh, on the grounds that since each independent social authority had to defend its own rights against other social authorities uh, to, by, so, uh, by force of arms if necessary, uh, this led to a lot of violence. It was all self-help remedies involved. And so the modern solution to this, um, what they considered anarchy, was to rethink of what a political society is. And they held that a political society is not a natural thing that evolves historically. It is an artificial thing. It's a corporation uh, created 
uh, by individuals pursuing their self-interest to protect their life, liberty, and property against this very medieval sort of uh, conflict that could arise. Now this kind of polity, and it did this by concentrating power in, in a central government that would have plenary power over individuals in a territory. So within the territory you didn't have the lords or the church or anything. You might have those things, but they were our artifacts of central power. If there was a church, it was an artifact of central power. If there were the lords, they were artifacts of central power and controlled ultimately by central power. And central power might be generous to give them considerable liberty, but it might take it back. That's a modern state. The American states are artificial corporations of the legislature of that state, and not of, not of the uh, people. <coughs> Okay, um, the Jeffersonian America that flourished from 1776 to 1860, that's how I define it, was a mosaic of independent social authorities. Now with this background in mind, let's ask the question, what was Jeffersonian America like before the Lincolnian Revolution? How did this quasi-medieval uh, polity work? Well, as in the Middle Ages, the lords, the church, and other independent social authorities sought to limit the king's ability to raise and spend money. That was the main thing. That's how you control centralization. Don't let the king have too much money or spend too much. Now, the Jeffersonians followed the same pattern. When Washington entered office, um, the debt, public debt, was $77 million. Seventy years later, when James Buchanan left office, it was $65 million. When has it been the case that a modern state debt has shrunk after 70 years? And remember, during this time, they had to pay the debt of the revolution, War of 1812, the Mexican War, they fought two wars, uh, they expanded to three times their size, three times, all the way to the Pacific and the Gulf of Mexico through purchase and conquest. And they reduced the debt. Do you understand what I said? They reduced the debt. Well, how much was that debt? It was a few thousand million dollars more than the cost of the government in 1860, which was 63 million. The debt was 65 million. That's Jeffersonian America. And don't say it couldn't do anything. It defeated the British in an eight year war, drove them out of America again in 1812, um, well, beat up on Mexico, and, uh, <laughs> and got, a lot, got California. So that gives you a picture of how this decentralized regime worked. Europeans, European, uh, Europeans uh, had high taxes, huge debt, crony capitalism, corruption, and endless wars carried out by the standing armies of centralized monarchies. Uh, not only that, but the American states were frugal. I don't have time to go into that, but they didn't spend much money. And they didn't have much debt. They did sometimes, but they, they got their balance. Uh, so um, you would be hard pressed to find anywhere in the world a people with more political liberty and individual liberty. The citizens, citizens, slaves didn't have it, but the slave, citizens with political liberty and individual liberty than in Jeffersonian America. Try to find another country with that kind of uh, political and individual liberty. And for the Jeffersonians, it was made possible because they had, they had turned off the faucet of money in Washington, or turned it down to a trickle. <clears throat> Yet we were taught in the 50s that liberty was secured by nationalist centralization. 
and Hamilton and all were presented as the heroes, which Lincoln secured by preventing secession, which have, would have broken the Union up and, uh, and not, not enabled us to have this marvelously centralized nation state. Another thing our history pre 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 uh, uh, suppressed was that the leaders of Jeffersonian America from 1776 to 1860 were mainly Southerners. Mainly, so and I mean mainly Southerners, although they were smaller in population. Southern presidents were elected to serve 52 of the first 72 years of the United States. It's a little imbalance, don't you think? 52 of the first 72 years. Only five presidents were elected from the North, and none served two terms. Whereas five Southern presidents served two terms each. New Englanders said, we are under a Virginia tyranny that, that hopes to be the Austria of America. And as of 1860, all the territory beyond the original 13 states, all the way from the Gulf of uh, Mexico to the Pacific, was acquired by Southern administrations. Southerners also dominated national offices out of, out of proportion to their population. Of attorneys general, there were 14 from the South, only five from the North. Of speakers of the House, 21 from the South, only 12 from the north. Chief justices, seven, 17 from the north, south, 11 from the north. Now there's another important feature of Jeffersonian America and that is it was Republican. Now we don't think much of that today because every country just about claims to be Republican, except a few monarchies. <clears throat> but at the time every country just about was monarchical, except for Switzerland. And the Republican tradition taught that no country could be a republic unless it was small, and real small. Why'd they say this? Well, the Greeks pretty much invented Republican life. The Romans came after them. What was Greek civilization? Around 1,500 tiny republics spread out from Naples to the Black Sea. That was Greek civilization. No centralization at all. And yet, it produced a brilliant civilization from which we still learn. <coughs> and that's what the Jeffersonians admired. They wanted to be like that as much as they could in these new circumstances. They wanted to be republicans. And they had to be small. Well, you see the problem. They inhabited a continent, and certainly by 1860 they had the whole thing from the Atlantic to the Pacific. You couldn't possibly be Republican. The solution was, well, yes, the territory is vast, but the population is small, very small. The largest city in 1776 was Philadelphia, with only 30,000 people. So when the founders talked about republicanism, that's what they meant. New York didn't get the size of ancient Athens at 300,000 to about 1830. Small, real small. The American solution then to republican size was to divide territorial jurisdictions through secession. That's how you're going to prevent centralization and have small size, or at least relatively small. Virginia led the way by ceding the Union to the Union, the vast Northwest Territory it had conquered from Britain on the ground that it could not both be a republic and rule such vast territory. They just couldn't be a republic. So they had to give it away. And as in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. <laughs> Virginia's stipulation was only that the people themselves within the territory should be able to form states of their own, secede, and apply for membership as equal sovereign states in the Union. 
Five states emerged from the territory in this way, and Virginia became known as, quote, the mother of states. How's that? The mother of states. Mama Virginia. <laughs> Lincoln was the conqueror of states. Father Abraham. <laughs> the great centralizer. In addition to this, Virginia allowed its western counties to secede and form the state of Kentucky. Lord, lead us not into temptation. We're too big. Even so, Jefferson thought it was still too large and proposed dividing it into small republics having sovereignty over local matters, similar to the Swiss cantons. As U.S. territory expanded to three times its original size, the same logic would apply. The people would form new states out of these vast territories, secede, and request equal membership in the Union. But what if the Union itself grew too large to be functional as a federation? That can happen. Well, no problem. Um, the states would secede from the Union and uh, form a new federation. No problem. They did it with the British. They did it on the Articles. Uh, the states did it. Uh, it was the American way. In Jeffersonian America. One Jeffersonian scenario was, was that there might be three federations of states in the future emerging along the Atlantic, Mississippi, and Pacific waterways. In this way, the Union itself, in the manner of Virginia, would become the mother of new unions of states. The United States would be Mama Union. <laughs> but not all were happy with this decentralized Jeffersonian America. Some wanted a purely European modern state. Remember, the modern state is purely European. Alexander Hamilton was one. He called the Constitution, quote, a frail and worthless fabric, end quote, because it did not place plenary power in the hands of the central government. By the 1830s, however, Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story and Senator Daniel Webster began cherry-picking passages from the historical record to make it say, make the Constitution say that it was never a compact between sovereign states. It just never happened. It was always a kind of modern state. Though historically false, this, this took, uh, uh, this, this false view took, Lincoln took this, sorry, Lincoln took this to be a fact accusing seceding, the seceding states of treason and justifying a war of conquest against them. Now until recently, the Lincolnian myth that America was somehow a modern state from the beginning has been the default position. We've got to understand that the Supreme Court has never taken up the question any, in any serious way about what secession is or whether it's legal. They haven't done it. There's one case, Texas versus White, but it's, it's, it, it doesn't go into any serious any detail. So Americans were silent on it. The war just ended. And what historic, when uh, Scalia was asked, can a state legally secede under the Constitution, Scalia's answer was, the war settled it. Uh, and he's an originalist. Would you think an originalist would go back to the original documents to see whether this would work? In other words, don't ask the question. Just don't ask it. Okay. Today, however, this default position is being questioned by historians who are not friendly at all to Confederate thinking. George Fletcher of Columbia Law School, in his book called Our Secret Constitution, How Lincoln Redefined American Democracy, you would think the people who should be able to redefine democracy, but no, no, Lincoln defined, redefined it. Just redefined it. He had a secret constitution, quite different from what he had inherited. And Fletcher says, this has become, quote, our constitution. Likewise, Gary Wills, in his well-known book, Lincoln at Gettysburg, argues that the constitutional vision Lincoln put forth in his famous speech was a lie. 
Wills calls the Gettysburg Address a great open-air swindle. And he says everyone in that audience, quote, was having his pockets picked, end quote. <laughs> Rather than see this as a fraud on the people, which is the kind of ordinary man might see it, uh, 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 that led to an unjustified war that cost a million lives, if we include those who died of in indirectly from the war. Um, rather than see it that way, Fletcher and Wills praises Lincoln as a great statesman because he made possible the destruction of the medieval Jeffersonian world in favor of a unitary modern state, one and indivisible, where power was centralized at the center and where states were artificial corporations of the American people. While Lincoln was engaged in the revolutionary act of building a modern American state, which, which had never existed before, the Confederates had succeeded to protect and perfect Jeffersonian, the Jeffersonian America of the founders. This is evident in the Confederate Constitution, which is simply the U.S. Constitution word for word except for two sets of reforms designed to better prevent the tyranny of limitless centralization. So they're continuing the Jeffersonian and the medieval prohibition against the center having too much power. <clears throat> the first set of these reforms attempts to limit the power of the central government altogether now to raise and spend money. The same thing. And it required two-thirds vote of both houses for a spending bill. Whew. <laughs> Unless the president made a special request, and then only if approved by a tribunal uh, established uh, in Congress. Uh, yeah, uh, by, by Congress, in Congress. Second, a spending bill must be for one item in its title, which rules out earmarks, spending spending irrelevant to the purpose of the bill. <laughs> Third, the president was given a line item veto. No, no, no. <clears throat> and one six-year term, he couldn't come back. Fourth, federal spending for infrastructure was prohibited. No pork barrel. No, 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 no subsidizing the Coca-Cola industry to start its, its, its bottling in China, <laughs> and so on. Finally, a tariff on imports that benefited one section over another was prohibited. Failure on this point, by the way, had just, just about threatened secession in 1828. The second set of changes I find very interesting. They enable states to better control centralization. In the regime we have now, only centralization can control centralization. And don't think about national elections doing anything. National elections, elections just acerbate centralization. Because once one group gets in power, it tries to centralize all it can to keep the others down. It gets out, and then the other gets it does the same thing. National elections are deadly for centralization. But state nullification is, is very powerful. So it had to be eliminated. But the Confederates uh, bring it out. First, two-thirds of both houses of a state legislature can impeach any federal office officer operating in its territory, even, even federal judges, to be tried in the Confederate House of Representatives. Think of that. Any, any district judge that hands out something, you, you could, if you could get two-thirds of the, of the House. All right. Uh, second, two-thirds of both houses of Congress are needed to annex a new state. Now that was a very good provision because whereas the U.S. Constitution requires only a simple majority to bring in a new state. <clears throat> um, with the Confederate rule in place, for example, Texas would never have been admitted. It was it's impossible in 1845, nor for the foreseeable future. And that would be true of Louisiana, uh, Missouri, and other, other states. They wouldn't have been admitted. 
And that would have been a good thing. Why? It would be a good thing because Americans would be forced to recognize that the conflicting interests that they were putting together in this big baby all the way to the Pacific, those interests were really different. And you're going to have a problem. So we're not letting Texas in here because New England, the Northeast, doesn't want to have to mess with that. And you're not letting Louisiana, Louisiana in. Uh, uh, John Quincy in 1811 said, if Louisiana is admitted to this union, it will mean the secession of New England. Well, it didn't secede, but you see the, you see the anger. So Louisiana came in, and what did people in New England do? They just smoldered with resentment. Just smoldered. And any chance they got to get back at those people who were trying to make uh, Virginia to the Austria of America, they were going to take. Very good not to let this certain states in and say, look, we're just too different. So let's just have two federations or three. Let nature work it out. If states were natural things, as the medievals think, that's how you would do it. But if it's an artificial corporation, you can't break that thing up, otherwise you have anarchy. Because it's an artificial thing to protect individual rights. <laughs> And not only that, uh, okay, the third is that the concurrence of only three states in the Confederacy was necessary to force a vote on a constitutional amendment. Whereas the U.S. Constitution requires two-thirds of the states not to vote on an amendment, no, it can't do that, but to call a convention to, quote, consider amendments. Whereas in the Confederacy, three states minority states could say, look, you people are going to have to pay attention to this. This is what we want. And they could say no. Or they could say, what's the compromise? At least we can get it out. No, it can't happen here. It's suppressed and it smolders. And it smolders. And it smolders. <clears throat> to ratify an amendment in the, in the Confederacy, you need two-thirds of the states. In the U.S., you need three-quarters. It does not speak well of the U.S. Constitution that in 235 years, the states themselves have never been able to initiate a single constitutional amendment. Absolute disgrace. Finally, a Confederate state may negotiate a withdrawal from the Confederacy. Now, let's shift over to Europe. which invented the modern state, which is now reaching um, its maturity around the mid-19th century. Alexis de Tocqueville viewed the rise of the modern state with great alarm. And he had come to America in 1831 to study its republican institutions. He observed with satisfaction that the states were sovereign political societies, each having what he called its own nationality. Quote, and the right of secession. Years later, he would express disgust that, quote, the whole of Europe, the whole of Europe was being consolidated into modern states with that ratchet of centralization turning. Quote, he says, the old localized authorities disappear either without revival or replacement. And everywhere the central government succeeds them in the direction of affairs. Everywhere men are leaving behind the liberty of the Middle Ages. The liberty of the Middle Ages. Not to enter into a modern brand of liberty, but to return to the ancient despotism, for centralization is nothing else than an up-to-date version of the administration seen in the Roman Empire. Many in Europe, like Tocqueville, looked to Jeffersonian America as a model of a large state for controlling centralization in Europe. Lord Acton was one of these. He thought the Confederate Constitution was the best instrument developed by human beings so far uh, for containing uh, centralization. And he wrote, quote, Secession filled me with hope. 
not as the destruction, but as the redemption of democracy, end quote. But that, that hope died with the Confederacy. And immediately after the war, he wrote, a, he wrote Robert E. Lee a letter saying, quote, I wept for the cause that was lost at Richmond more than I rejoiced at the one won at Waterloo, end quote. After the war, Alexander Stevens, former vice president of the Confederacy, wondered if Americans were so foolish and blind as to follow the path of European modern centralization, which so horrified Tocqueville and Acton. And at the end of, of um, and which would end in totalitarian rule if not prevented, <clears throat> Stevens declared, quote, there is no difference in his, mem in his uh, memorial, his, uh, sorry, his, um, yeah, his memoirs. Uh, there, quote, there is no difference between centralization and imperialism. If the worst is to befall us, if centralism is ultimately to prevail, if our entire system of free institutions as established by our common ancestors is to be subverted and an empire is to be established in their stead, then be assured that we of the South will be acquitted by the judgment of mankind of all responsibility for so terrible a catastrophe and from all the guilt of so great a crime against humanity." End quote. Academic historians ridicule this as an effort to hide the fact that the war was really about the moral challenge of slavery. And Stevens is just trying to cover that up. But that is not how Lincoln viewed it, nor Jefferson Davis viewed it. Lincoln said the war was the war is for, quote, a great national object, and there is no reason to drag the Negro into it, end quote. A great national, what was this great national object? The great national object um, is exactly how, is to turn, is to destroy Jeffersonian America and replace it with a European style modern state. We need a modern state, and that's what the war is about. Well, so uh, the London Spectator, um, a liberal um, journal at that time, and a very nationalistic journal, wrote in 1866 uh, about the war in just those terms. Quote, the American Revolution, the Revolution, marches fast toward its goal, the change of a federal commonwealth into a democratic republic, one and indivisible, end quote. In other words, secession is now unthinkable because it's a modern billiard ball state. Lincolnian America developed into a flourishing nationalist regime in which Southerners found their place and were among its most, most loyal supporters. You know, if we can't, if we lost the war, okay, we'll just join the Union. But it has exhausted its moral resources and is now coming apart from within. It was a great ride for over a century, but now it's, it's in trouble. Every presidential election since 2000 has been contested as invalid by uh, sections of each party. The national debt today is over 31 trillion. If the unfunded liability is included, Social Security, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, the debt will be over 222 trillion. 222, do you know how much a trillion dollars is? If you spent a million dollars every day, every day, it would take you 2,700 years to spend a trillion. That would take you back to before the Babylonian captivity of the Hebrews. I don't know about you, but a million dollars would mean a lot to me. That's just one day. That would mean a lot to me. And all of you. You can, you can use a million. 222 million is what our liability is. Uh, Lincolnian America has degenerated into a self-centralizing machine that like a cancerous cell has lost the knowledge of how to stop centralizing power. When it confronts a problem, the only thing it knows to do is centralize more power, build more bureaucracies, raise more taxes, debt to pay for it. And it's run out of, it's run out of gas. And this hard fact has revived what was heretofore unthinkable, namely the discourse of secession. Today, in the last, or at least in the last decade, polls show an astonishing support for state secession by left, right, 
all ages and so on. A Zogby poll in 2017, for example, found that 39% of voters favored secession of their state and 29% were not sure. That means that 68% are willing to, to think about it. Not sure, maybe. <laughs> when a YouGov poll conducted in June of 2021 asked voters whether they would like their region to secede, not the state, but the region to secede, New England, the Rocky Mountains, the South, and so on, the figures were much higher. For example, <clears throat> um, Republicans favored, Southern Republicans favored secession by 66%. And Southern independence favors secession by 50%. Also favoring secession were Rocky Mountain Republicans at 43%, West Coast Democrats at 47%, Northeast Democrats at 39%, and independence in the Midwest and Plains at 43%. How are we to understand this fracturing of Lincolnian America? Now, I want to stress, this isn't going away. This talk about secession is not something that'll, that'll change once we get the right president in. This is deep. It has the support of scholars. I don't have time to go into them. Pundits. It's a minority report, but they have, there's a support of those and substantial members of the Republic are very deeply dissatisfied with the structure of the United States. Not policy, but the structure. Secession is not about policy. It's about dividing the territorial jurisdiction. You see the difference? How are we to understand this? Well, and then we'll... Uh, Sorry, let me see what time I got. Okay. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln sought to transform Jeffersonian America into a unitary state with a strong European-style national identity. But Jeffersonian America was not that. It was a compact between sovereign states similar to the European Union. The European Union is not a nation. It has no national identity. Italy does, Spain does, but not the European Union. Neither was the United States uh, a nation. Or you could use scare quotes and call it a nation. But it wasn't conceived in 1860 as a nation. It was a federation, kind of like the European Union. We tend to think of it today in Lincolnian terms, but you have to try to get back to see how people were thinking of it. Uh, Francis Bellamy, for example, wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. Why did he write it? He wrote it because Northerners were losing their patriotism. They were slipping back into Jeffersonian mannerisms. The states were acting up and he, he had to do something about it. So he wrote the Pledge of Allegiance and he said, I wrote it to explain the meaning of the war. And he said that meaning could be reduced to three words. One nation indivisible. That's why it was written. That's why the war was fought. And these Poles are saying, we don't buy it. We think it is divisible. Yeah. This is a revival of Jeffersonian dispositions that are deep in the DNA of Americans but were suppressed. Jeffersonians are left-wing. The, 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 the left-wing people in California who want secession, they're left-wing Jeffersonians. See? And they're right-wing Jeffersonians. So <laughs> that's the situation. So uh, how is America going to ha be a nation state? Where are you going to get a nation when you don't have one? You just have these, these very, New England can't define the nation. South can't define it. How are you going to have a nation? So what the Lincolnians did is they fixed on two elements, a culture and an ideology. And those two things they could bring together to form a real national identity. Well, what was the culture? Well, they looked around and there was a generic Anglo-Protestant culture which established practices by the founding settlers of the British Isles that planted Christianity, the English language, British legal and political institutions, an ethic of individualism, work, dissent, and the English language. All that was planted 
in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, as, and as in other colonies, whatever was planted by the founders becomes the whole thing, more or less. All the Brazilians speak Portuguese. <coughs> All the signers of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were Protestants, except one Catholic signer of the Declaration and two Catholics signed the Constitution. So it was a Protestant culture. You didn't have to be a Protestant, but you had to realize you were in a Protestant culture. And we expect you to behave yourself. <laughs> That's what all, all nation states do. And the Jews came to Charleston and said, we'll behave ourselves. They said, fine. Start a shop. We need somebody to, 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 to sell this stuff. So the second element was an ideology. And that was incompatible with the culture. An ideology is not to get into it, this is very, very complicated. The ideology was an egalitarian ideology of natural rights which drifted over from the French Revolution and Lincoln built into the Gettysburg Address. Lincoln defined America not as a culture, but as an abstract idea. It's just an idea, a philosophic idea that's been implanted in the world. That's all it is. To be an American, all you have to do is subscribe to the idea that all men are created equal. <laughs> the problem with that is that all those, although abstract egalitarian principles uh, are self-evident because they're abstract, they have no content. You don't know how to interpret them. All men are created equal. In what respect? In what respect? It doesn't say in what respect. Well, they're males and females. Do they, are they to be treated equally in war and everything else? Well, you have to try to ask, well, what is a woman? Well, what is a man? What is a man? Well, see, that has nothing to do with equal rights. That just has to do with metaphysics. What is a woman really? What is a man really? And once we know that, once we answer that, then we can kind of figure out what, whether their rights are equal or whether there should be exceptions and that sort of thing. Now, you answer that second question, in what respect? You either answer it arbitrarily, it's whatever I say it is, I've got power, they're equal in this respect, and that's the only respect we're going to consider, because I've got power and lack of shame to order it, or, or you appeal to what everybody knows, a common moral tradition, or what most everybody knows, or what enough people know to make it work, a common moral tradition. So you might say, well, look, the Bible says man, God made them ma male and female, and that might be enough for many people to buy. Well, you know, and it seems right, you know, they look like male and female to me. <laughs> so every abstract principle in science, chemistry, psychology, law, morals, every abstract principle has to be interpreted by a tradition of practices. A tradition. So tradition is not a barrier to rationality, it is an instrument of rationality. And that's a little complicated, I don't have time to explain it, but we can do so later if you're interested. <clears throat> the long and short of it is the idea that America is an, ide an ideology, an egalitarian ideology, that the central government has the power to implant on, in, in America um, is incoherent. It's either arbitrary or it's based on a moral tradition. If it's based on a moral tradition, it's not an ideology. If you appeal to the Bible, are you, are you appealing to an ideology? No, you're appealing to a sacred tradition to explain what a man and woman are. So every abstract principle needs a tradition to interpret. Let me give you another example. Take the metric system. It's a wonderful system. You can measure the metric length of anything. But it doesn't tell you, in its abstract character, how long a meter is. It could be this long. It could be this long. How long is it? You have to go to practices and tradition to find out how long the meter is. With someone who has the authority to say so. And once you have that, the metric system can be used. But if you don't have that, you, don't, you can't measure anything. You see? So it's the same with ideologies. Unless you have a measuring rod, knowing what a man is, what a woman is, unless you have a measuring rod, you can't apply the ideology. Now, I'm going to call those 
And we're getting now to the end, to, 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 to how the culture war is coming apart. I'm going to call those who favored a culture-based national identity, an Anglo-Protestant idiom, and an Anglo-Protestant idiom, I'm going to call these um, right-wing Lincolnians. They're right-wing because they're appealing to tradition to explain natural rights. And I'm going to call those who favored a culture-free um, America, an enlighten, Enlightenment America, I'm going to call them left-wing Lincolnians. Because they're saying culture is not important at all. All you need is the, is the uh, abstract ideology. <laughs> now, the right-wing Lincolnians created a prosperous and illustrious nationalism. They did create a nationalism, uh, more or less, that dominated for over a century. But in time, Protestant elites had so secularized their faith and had become stung by so, all, so often by left-wing Lincolnian critiques of their prejudices and particularisms that they gradually lost confidence in their own culture. The death of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture is something historians write about. Or the death of the dominance. Those, um, okay, sorry. So by the end of the 1960s, uh, the left-wing Lincolnian had come to dominate. But that is not all, and the right-wing Lincolnian faded back. He's still there, but he faded back. A new character appeared, which we'll call the cultural Marxist American. He's a real American, but he's a cultural Marxist American. And he began his career, we might say, as a left-wing Lincolnian. But he soon recognized that the, its critical application of natural rights was not neutral, as it was loudly proclaimed, but smuggled in favorite prejudices from Anglo-Protestant culture, while deceptively passing those off as the work of self-evident natural rights. The cultural Marxist American concluded from this that there is no culture-free political rationality. None. And that politics is merely a power struggle between cultures. They, they admit they're cultures, but there's no culture free and there's no principle of binding, binding them. So he set his face in opposition to, to both Anglo-Protestant and Enlightenment left-wing Lincolnian culture and gave his allegiance to non-white minority cultures and to a spiritual zoo of gender identities. With these and a limited number of fellow traveling left-wing Lincolnians, because left-wing Lincolnians are kind of fellow travelers of wokeness. I mean, they don't, they're not woke, but they're, they're like the fellow travelers under communism in America in the 50s. <laughs> now, if we look at the culture war itself in a dimension we haven't yet, dis yet discussed, it's helpful to say there was a horizontal plane of the culture war and a vertical plane. On the horizontal plane, we have our three ideologies, the right-wing Lincolnian, the left-wing Lincolnian, the cultural Marxist American, all competing to seize the plenary power of the central government to impose their view of the nationality that should characterize all Americans. That's the horizontal plane. That's a struggle for power, central power. The vertical plane is the awakening of Jeffersonian America. These Americans aren't interested in controlling central power. They are interested in seceding from it. They're interested in withdrawing from it. So that's a dimension to the culture war that you're not going to hear about on the news. You're going to hear about Black Lives Matter and so on, but you're not going to hear about this. And you're not going to hear about it on, on Fox either. But that's a dimension of the culture war. So how might the culture war end with this conflict of the vertical and the horizontal planes? It is unlikely that any of the three ideologies above can establish a national identity with the social trust and allegiance enjoyed by right-wing Lincolnians for over a, a century. There was a time when people get on say, uh, TV and say, my fellow Americans, and it kind of meant something. It means nothing now. Who are you talking to? My you know, I'm not one of the people you talk. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, the right-wing Lincolnian, um, the left-wing Lincolnian cannot uh, supplant the right-wing Lincolnian because no country has been or ever could be founded strictly on an abstract ideology. The cultural Marxists can't do it because his is an ideology of resentment with nothing positive to teach. You can't build a nation on resentment. Nor can the right-wing Lincolnian regain dominance because due to incremental, incremental secularization he's lost faith in his own tradition as a shadow of his former self. But he still exists. Failure to resolve the nationalist struggle on the horizontal plane through central authority is likely to generate greater fracturing of American identity. If they can't get it straight on the horizontal plane, then the vertical plane is going to get more and more fragmented. If so, the cultural war could end with a strong revival of Jeffersonian America, with its teaching about republicanism at a human scale, the evils of centralization in states of vast size, and the right of secession. That would be easier today to do than in Lincoln's time because secession is not viewed with the horror that it was in the 19th century. It was viewed as anarchy. Lincoln calls it just plain anarchy. Well, people don't do that today. Well, how did that, how did that change happen? The, the great ca change came in part from an unlikely source, the Soviet Union. Which amend, now, most of you don't know this. I'd be surprised if anybody did. Um, the Soviet Constitution of 1977 amended, was amended to allow lawful secession of states from the Union. Further modifications were made in the amendment in 1990. And in 1991, it was acted upon and 15 states seceded lawfully from the Union. And uh, you, you can see the TV report of, of Gorbachev on television announcing, I think it was Christmas Day or the day, the day before Christmas, anyway, announcing the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the Communist Party. This was arguably the greatest democratic revolution in modern history, or perhaps in all history. Only years later, Quebec nearly seceded 51 to 49 percent from Canada, and later Scotland nearly seceded from Britain by a very close margin. A number of states seceded from Eastern Europe. Britain seceded from the EU and, and successful non-binding referenda on secession have been held in the Italian regions of Lombardy and in the Veneto, as well as in Catalonia and Spain. And there are rumblings other places. Uh, it should not be surprising that the Soviet Union, a totalitarian state whose people had experienced the worst that the centralized modern state can do, was the first to break the modern state's grip on the prohibition of secession. But it was Jeffersonian Americans under a long line of southern leaders that foresaw totalitarianism at the end of the road and worked out a constitutional right of secession to control centralization. I hearken back to Alexander Stevens' speech about centralization. Southerners actually saw this and worked out a constitutional mechanism to prevent it. Nevertheless, um, and, and, and so these thoughtful Jeffersonian Confederates, and I have just a page or so next to go, was ahead of its time. Ahead of its time. But suffered a violent death in its infancy. Nevertheless, we should, it should be ret retrospectively viewed as the unsung mother of the liberal and humane opinion many have of secession today. The Confederacy was the mother of this more enlightened notion of secession, or more generous notion. Eugene Genovese, said by the Atlantic Monthly in the 1990s to be America's greatest living historian, is rare in observing that it was Southern thinkers, quote, that created the first native critique of the totalitarianism that has run amok in the 20th century, end quote. We were the first. That totalitarianism would not have been possible 
without modern state centralization. Wouldn't have been possible. George Kennan, one of the memorable men of the 20th century and author of the policy to contain the Soviet Union, argued in 1993 that the U.S. is simply too large for centralization and we should begin a public debate on how best to divide it. For the sake of argument, let's just consider very briefly how big the United States is. A regional division into four federations of states, the North, South, Midwest, and West, in that division, the Southern Federation will be the third largest nominal GDP in the world, after China and Japan. The Northern Federation will be fourth, and the Western Federation fifth. The Midwest Federation would be the tenth largest, but not far behind France, Britain, Brazil, and um, greater than Russia, which would be eleventh. Now we can argue, I say the Southern Federation, you could argue, well, what's in the Southern Federation? You know, or, you know is, is Kentucky in it or so on? You can argue about that, but I just arbitrarily uh, drew these, these out. In this country of four states, there would be no Lincolnian national identity spread from Atlantic to Pacific, which each of our three ide uh, ideologies on the horizontal scale are trying to create. But this would not bother the Jeffersonian Americans because they got on quite well without a European national identity. They didn't have one. They had a federation. Recall that the Jeffersonians expected the Union to become the mother of new unions. Nor is it likely that these four states would pool their resources to fight preemptive wars and proxy wars of regime change to impose a common ideological American-style liberal democracy around the globe. They wouldn't, would not be likely to do that. At least one of them might object. Our failed Middle East wars so far have cost $8 trillion. $8 trillion, according to the uh, uh, Watson Institute of Boston University. To conclude, we should do all we can to revive interest and respect for our Confederate heritage and its symbols which the right-wing Lincolnian protected. That's why we had them in the 50s. But we should not make an idol of them, nor should we fall into despair if any of them are removed, if all of them are removed from the public sphere. Consider that when Southerners took the painful and uncertain steps to secede from the United States, and when they sat down to reform the Jeffersonian Constitution their ancestors ratified, 1788, in order to better prevent centralization, they had no Confederate symbols in order to better, uh, sorry, no Confederate symbols to support them or guide them. They were guided only by their courage and convictions, and that must be our posture. They didn't have any Confederate symbols. And that means we must come to know the difference between the modern state with its peculiar power dynamics and the federative republicanism of our Confederate ancestors. I'm grateful I came of age in the 50s, surrounded by Confederate symbols and songs and national respect for Southern valor. But it was an age that hid from view the constitutional, moral, and philosophic meaning of the war. Today, even with the loss of so many of our monuments and symbols, thanks to the Abbeville Institute and other institutions of similar kind, and the internet, and the culture war, we have to thank the culture war too, we are vastly more informed about the deeper meaning of the war. My generation in the 50s did not know that we were living in the last days of right-wing Lincolnian America. We were in the last days, which both protected our symbols and impoverished our political education. It did both. Thank you.